Thank you, Sally, for your presentation. Just to remind me that I have been trying twice. Ah. A very pleasant situation. <laughs> <laughs> and it also raised me that we have a lot of frivolous challenges. Yes. Uh, this is part of the strategy of the party to challenge the legislators more often not to serve the decisions and the war. So we are also facing this kind of challenge. So my duty here is to discuss how can we avoid bad arbitrators, including wrong arbitrators and the pitfall. I would like to make a step back and just present to you how do I see the what is the international what is the landscape for international commercial arbitration. And of course, coming from Brazil, I'll quote uh, you know Pepe Mujica, the Uruguay former president said, Yo vengo del sur. Uh, the South is quite a different pra practice. It's a very large practice of arbitration, international arbitration in the South. But it's slightly different from what you have here. Uh, <clears throat> well, what's the common sense? Common sense is that when the case arises, there is a discussion between what really happened in the case and of course the interpretation of the different sets of rules that interact with the facts. You have of course the contract, the usages practice, the applicable law for the merits, and the arbitration rules, all these sets of rules, sometimes they are doubled or tripled, you have different applicable laws for different parts of the contracts. Uh, uh, the more the contracts are, uh, more difficult is to understand what the law is for the specific situation. So, this is the battlefield. And what happens in practice? In practice, that everything, every piece of fact, every piece of evidence is challenged by the parties. So, you have a complete mess. <laughs> and this happens in almost all the cases. No? And it's more complex in international arbitration than in domestic because, of course, you have the applicable law that sometimes is different from the place of the particular contract is performed. You have different usages that are applicable because you have not only local usages, you have international usages. And you have, more importantly, a bunch of cultural uh, aspects that interfere. Who that are driven by who, in, who is working the case, who the players are. So, in principle, you have the arbitrators, the lawyers, the parties, and the institution. They have all their different nationalities, and this means that they have different mindsets. So, it's absolutely different. A case that is where the lawyers are from international, English, or American law firms, from cases where you have French, or Brazilian, or Korean. Uh, law firms working with because the lawyers themselves they have their bias, their systems of law, the way they work, so the way they perceive the case and they present the case for the arbitrator is different. You have also the different backgrounds of the arbitrators. You have arbitrators that are practitioners, arbitrators who are scholars, others that are not yet, don't have legal training. There are a lot of cases in construction we have engineers who are working in the case as, as arbitrators. In cases of uh, financial agreements, it's not uncommon to have someone that's from this bit from this industry. So, and, but more importantly, what you really have is different conceptions of arbitration, how to handle arbitration, how the arbitrate, how the tribunal interacts, how the parties uh, shall behave uh, during the case. So it's a melting pot when we are in a in our international relations are not important, sometimes with very bad outcomes. And each of these players have a different mission. So, of course, the arbitrators, their main mission is to conduct the proceeding with efficiency and issue of added war, which means uh, efficient time and cost effective, means flexibility to include the party's legitimate expectations. It also means to focus on the development, give some kind of speed, some direction to the proceedings towards a final award, uh, getting out of the slant of exchange of documents, discovery, uh, 
uh, written statements, hearings, and so on. And with all this, respecting the due process of law. But it's also the mission of the arbitrators to render a fair decision on the merits. I think most of the parties expect to have a fair decision. <clears throat> and then, for doing that in the international commercial arbitration landscape, they have to understand and consider the different rules that may be applied. The contract, the usages, the applicable law, and all of these will affect, of course, their reputation. The mission of the lawyers is a bit different. They want to win the case, no matter what. Right? And that's very important because what we see in practice, not in the events, because in the events, most of the people start saying, well, what we would like to have in, uh, in the arbitration uh, playfield. But in fact, in the concrete situations, we see very competitive and aggressive uh, litigators working in arbitration. So there is no much room for courtesy. All the courtesy is only a rhetorical thing. What happens in the case is a, a shock and a sometimes a very aggressive uh, presentation from the lawyers. Yeah. And we see we have why do you think we have the guidelines now for ethics uh, of party representation or for, for lawyers? It's because, in fact, what we see a lot of times are witnesses that are lying, documents that are being changed, uh, manufacturing evidence, uh, challenging decisions by only to gain time, requiring a number of uh, expertise in order to gain time, to make confusion. So, <clears throat> It's a one rule. Uh, so what is important to understand is that the outcome of any, any international commercial arbitration depends a lot on the combination of these factors that I have just spoken about. I mean, the, if you have a tribunal that is a common law formed by only common law arbitrators, it's very different from a, a tribunal uh, of a civil law uh, background. So uh, if you have English law firms working, and you have civil law firms working, is a different outcome. So it's very hard to say if that arbitration is a very uh, secure uh, environment because the decision, the final decision, will rely a lot on the combination of these aspects. How is the, the case presented? Who are the arbitrators that are going to decide? How is the institution interfering in the case? So, in this complex context, choosing wrong arbitrators might engender serious risk. And this is also one of the reasons that explain why you have a small club of arbitrators. Because when you are choosing an arbitrator and you see that the, that the case is complex, that the parties are going to be aggressive, you have to have someone that knows how to handle the situation not only in the perspective of assuring that the due process of law will be uh, observed, but also uh, the cause of the case. Uh, you do want someone that understands the usage of the case, the understand the contract, the practice of the contract. And there are not so many people like this. So if you want a case of, let's take about an example of m &A transaction, are you going to choose a scorer or are you going to choose a practitioner? And if you, your case is more a uh, theoretical case, out of the contract, then you're going to a scholar, probably, not to a practitioner. Uh, if you want to apply the contract, you're going to a practitioner. And how do you find information about who's going to decide in what direction? And you don't have it in anywhere. So that's why, when you have experience with some kind of arbitrator, and the arbitrator is knowledge in, in arbitration, culture, and arbitration uh, user, and knows the merits of the case, this person creates a reputation that's going on and on and is being appointed again. And that's why it's also very hard to appoint someone outside this club. Because how can you have a case if you are a client, it's always the most important case you should have. How can you say to the client, let's try someone new that never had a case with arbitration? It won't work. It's very hard for the client to accept. Uh, so, of course, there are nuances in this. There are different possibilities. But the wrong choices are these ones. I choose an arbitration because I know him very well. 
because it's someone from my jurisdiction, because it's famous, and because it's the worst case, because it's partial or anything like that. Right? And this is very common. Let's choose someone because I think that this person will advocate in my in favor of my position in the tribunal. And arbitrators are not the smartest guy in the world. They are not as the most stupid one. So when we are in a tribunal and we see that a co-arbitrator is slightly or explicitly partial, what happens? The other two, they close themselves and decide to run the case without the participation of the third one. Okay? That happens very frequently when you see the situation. So one experienced arbitrator knows that he cannot do that because this will also affect his reputation. In the next tribunal, the other arbitrators will say, let's not appoint him because he's too partial. Mm -hmm. We cannot have this person in the tribunal. Mm -hmm. And there are people that just went through the arbitration career, arbitrator career, because of this. They started working in one, two, three, four cases, and then the reputation is so bad that no one wants to appoint him anymore. And it's bad for the client because the other arbitrators will decide the case alone. And sometimes the, the case of this client, of this party, will not be heard, would be even more difficult to be heard because the one arbitrator is being so explicitly in favor of this party. So, and personal knowledge, uh, I mean, it's not important. It's not really important because, you know, in Brazil we have a, a small community of arbitrators and, and lawyers that do the case. Uh, we all have a lot of cases. I have, for instance, 20 cases as arbitrator and 10 cases as, as counsel right now. And our firm will have a track record of 300 cases. Uh, but we never choose someone because we know this person. I mean, it's not important. The person will decide the case because he's, he's convinced or not, persuaded or not, of the case. So, personal knowledge if you think that someone is going to decide, in your favor because he knows, he or she knows you, it's, it's a wrong criteria. Someone from my jurisdiction, it's also a very wrong uh, parameter because if I have a case, uh, and that ha happens very much, when people doing business like in Brazil, in foreign companies, they say, okay, let me appoint, uh, I'm from Britain, British, from the UK, so let me appoint a British arbitrator. But the applicable law is Brazil law. And then the arbitrator is also outside the dialogue of what's going on. Because he doesn't know, he, he or she doesn't know how the law interferes in the case. If you take a construction case, for instance, you have a lot of public policy interfering in the, in the, in the case. You have administrative law, labor law, tax law, um, real estate law interfering in the case, and will, will affect the, the outcome of the, the case. And a uh, foreign arbitrator, or someone that is not knowledgeable in the domestic applicable law, not be able to, to have a word in this case. So we have to take care of all these decisions. Famous arbitrators, the problem of famous arbitrators is that the two famous ones, uh, sometimes they don't think they need the help of the lawyers to decide. So they decide all alone on, on, on the aspect that they think it's the correct decision. Right? And there are some literature about this right now. People are complaining and complaining because they're so experienced that they say the best decision of this case is this one, regardless of the law, the contract, the users, <laughs> and so far so on. If that's my position, and that since I'm so famous and so on, I'm so reputed, that's my view. And we have some talents and we move on towards awards in the end because of this kind of position. So you have to take care. <clears throat> uh, the risk, of course, of choosing uh, the wrong arbitrations are to have wrongful or unfair decisions, waste of time of money because the decisions can be challenged and decided in one void. And of course, the loss of credibility, not only of the arbitrator, but most importantly, from the international commercial system. Uh, it's a system that is based in trust because it's a voluntary system. Uh, if we will have room for uh, decisions based uh, in, not on the merits of the case, but based on the applicable law, on the contract, this kind of things. It will weaken the system, the whole system. So, I think the first, uh, the most important 
parameter for choosing arbitration is that each case requires bit thinking about it. The French have an expression that is uh, arbitrage for la vie. It means that uh, the arbitration, the arbitration is only as good as the arbitrator is. So maybe if you have one decision to make, a uh, correct decision to make during a case is to choose the right arbitration. But there is no not one arbitrator that fits all the situation. For every case, you have to re re consider a lot of, of different criteria. One of these criteria is, what's the ground for your case? Are you, is your case based on the law, on the contract, on usage? And that's very important because, as I was telling you, if your case is based in the law, you might look for a score. Because there are sometimes, it's very common, that the law is different from the contract itself. And who prevails? What prevails? The law or the contract? It's an issue to be decided case by case. You may say in common law jurisdictions, it's the, it's the contract. In civil law, you have to integrate both. But there are things that are public policy. So we have case law like in, in, now in Brazil, a lot of cases that concern corruption because of the car wash uh, operation. And the state and the state law companies, companies that are all arguing that the contract is no longer void. So it's a very theoretical decision and it's outside the contract, no matter what the contract says. So what kind of arbitrator do you want? Mm -hmm. uh, you have also to consider what's the other part of ground. Because when you're choosing an arbitrator, you have to think who the other part is going to choose. Because they're going to interact. And somehow you want the arbitrator that you are appointing because you believe that this person uh, is more keen to understand your, your perspective, will prevail, or at least will be heard and have a word in the tribunal. But then you consider oh, the other part is going to choose a big shot. Is going to choose a foreign, uh, a foreign arbitrator, and then you make your step. Also, depending on the party, you might. Be. You have to consider if you have a strong case or a weakened case, and most likely you always have a mixed case because there are so many issues in a complex case that we are not going to win everything or lose everything. But you have to understand uh, where exactly you will want to make your point. Uh, so, what's the right person that will perceive this point? Uh, so, uh, you also want to decide if you want to have a domestic or international approach in your case. And for instance, we have had a case that the law, the applicable law is New York law. But let's appoint a Brazilian one. It's the opposite I just said. You don't should not appoint someone that doesn't know the applicable law. But maybe that's your interest. I don't want to apply New York law. The substantive law of the contract is New York law, but I don't want to apply. The fact that the contract was uh, uh, performed in Brazil and have a lot of Brazilian issues interfering in the contract, let's appoint a Brazilian uh, lawyer or a Brazilian scholar. So all this is strategy. Huh? All this is strategy. So that's why at this moment you have to decide. And usually, if you are the claimant, even before filing the request for arbitration, you are already thinking and discussing and sharing with the clients the names, the possibilities, the risk of the name of arbitration. And that's why it's a club. I think that's the main reason why it is a club. It's not because we go to conferences, not because we publish articles. It's because the parties and the lawyers, they think that this person has uh, We'll, we'll understand uh, your case and we'll be able to have a certain influence in the tribunal because there is no such a thing of a totally independent and impartial or the core arbitrator. Uh, in practice, what happens is that the core arbitrator, what he or she does, that he brings the main arguments that the party who has appointed this person to the knowledge and to the discussion. It doesn't mean that he will agree with the party who appointed him or But at least he will bring this argument and we'll discuss. Uh, if you have someone that you think that will agree with your point of view, this is the perfect arbitrator, it's independent, 
is not connected with you, has credibility, and, and we and be persuaded of your argument. So we will bring a voice inside the tribunal. That's the choice. And also, it's the trend now in international arbitration, also in domestic arbitration, that the parties have a voice in choosing the chairman of the tribunal. It's not anymore as it used to be until five years ago that the two core arbitrators would solely decide who the chairman is. Right now, uh, the core arbitrators, uh, the, the parties, they discuss with the core arbitrators. And they even, there are lists, they represent the parties. So the parties have a voice in deciding who the chairman is. And that's, I think, a very fair uh, trend because in the end of the day, the chairman is the most important arbitrator because it can have decision two against one. And also the chairman is the one who writes the awards, writes the decisions, uh, who handles a lot of, of, of document exchange decisions, a lot of decisions, interim decisions during the proceeding. So it's very fair that the parties can have a voice in who is going to be the most important arbitrator. Maurice, I'll give you a couple two minute warning. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, so, the last availability and engagement there of arbitrators, I, I included uh, engagement because all arbitrators say they are available, no matter if they have one case or if they have 100 cases, they all say we are available for your case. But the most important thing is the engagement because sometimes we are discussing some cases, we have arbitrators, for arbitrators that have one or two cases, they don't care, they don't participate, they don't, they don't. They have other things to do in life. They are scholars, they are writing, or they are practitioners, they are billing hours, and they don't care about the case. So the most important character you want is an engagement of the arbitration, to read everything and to uh, participate in the tribunal. That's, uh, that's the most important issue. So that was the point I wanted to do. Thank you. Very much.